My name is Nagraj, and um, I'm going to continue uh, this section that is um, the class after um, set of classes after Girish has taught. Um, and um, the intent of this set of classes is going to be um, to kind of introduce you to the cell. Okay. Um, I think um, uh, I have been at ISA Pune for 12 years now, and I run a research lab here, and my lab studies cells and I've studied cells for a very long time too. Um, and the thing that is really interesting and remarkable about cells is that um, we're still discovering uh, new things about them. Okay. So, so there are um, things we know uh, about cells. There are things we don't know about cells. Um, and um, this set of lectures is kind of um, aiming to introduce you to some fundamentals about how to think about cells, right? How they are built. Um, you know, there is a lot of talk these days about making an artificial cell, you know, and um, bringing together many components to kind of define or make a cell. Um, and, um, you know, to do anything like that, we will need to have a fair understanding of how cells um, are put together to begin with, right? And so, um, the intent of this class is to kind of give you that flavor of what cells are like. Um, they are fairly interesting things, right? And, and they do very complex um, processes and events um, very seemingly, okay? Um, I think something as simple as, um, you know, me talking to you today um, and you being able to wake up and understand everything that I'm saying um, is driven by cells. Right, the, um, there are cells in our brain that are um, that are firing, allowing me to communicate what I'm thinking, um, and um, and it's happening very very rapidly. Right, the thought about what word I'm going to say next um, happens a fraction of a second before I'm saying it. Right, um, and then this sound as it travels to you, um, and you're able to tune in and listen into this. Uh, your brain also almost immediately processes every word that comes your way to kind of make sense of what I'm trying to say, right? Um, and, and, and all of this is happening because of cells, okay? Um, and, um, and so how cells work together, you know, how are they put together? Um, you know, what is the architecture of cells like? Um, contributes to everything that's happening here, by the way. Okay, so so that architecture is what we are going to try and introduce you to. I'm going to try and introduce you to. You know, clearly, you guys have been exposed to a lot of new things uh, in in the first uh, you know set of lectures, um, and and what we are hoping we will do is um, you know get you to think about cells in the remaining half. Right, um, think about how they're put together. You know. My hope is at the end of this class, if somebody turns a uh, set of lectures, if somebody turns around you and say, tomorrow, if you had to build a cell, you know, how do we do this? You will have a sense of, you know, how to think about it, right? Um, and I'm going to quickly walk you through um, the thought process on why I think microscopy is something that I wanted you to be introduced to, uh, you know, before we do cell biology. Okay, um, and um, it's a very interesting um, area which has, uh, you know, dramatically affected um, how we think about cell biology. And um, the reason we think about microscopy in the context of um, biology of cells is rather simple, actually, because um, a lot of our understanding of cells uh, has emanated from the fact that uh, there is all this information that is available about cells. Um, and a lot of that has come from, from looking at cells and looking at what they do, right? Um, so, so that's, um, uh, you know, vital to our understanding of cells. And it all began uh, with the discovery of, uh, of, of something that was the, um, was the origin of a microscope, uh, by Zacharias Johnson, um, and this was somewhere in the 16th century, right? 1580 to 1638 is when he lived. Um, and uh, this looks more like a telescope than a microscope, 
right uh, but um, it allowed uh, you to magnify things you know up to about three times um, and but that uh, you know that by itself uh, changed um, you know what we were what they were able to look at and the fact that they were able to look at uh, new things uh, allowed for um, us to now start noticing things that were happening uh, you know that we couldn't otherwise right um, the very simple microscope that um, Leeuwenhoek uh, developed, uh, you know, this is a replica of the same. Um, and as you can see, you know, the optics were very simple. The light source was actually uh, white light. Um, and, um, uh, you know, he was able to uh, look at things, look at movement of stuff. Um, and just the idea of being able to look at these things, things that are happening um, in, in a drop of water, for example, from a pond can be quite remarkable, uh, you know, if you've never seen them before. Right. And it's this curiosity uh, that, uh, you know, even today is, um, you know, is being exploited, you know. So, uh, Leeuwenhoek um, made this microscope in 1670. Um, and, you know, I don't know how many of you uh, know about Manu Prakash and, the, and this uh, fold scope that they developed uh, a few years ago. Right. Um, and it's a remarkable thing. Manu's lab is in Stanford and, uh, you know, they develop, among other things, tools. Um, you know, they, and, and this is um, a, a paper microscope, right, which kind of um, takes its inspiration uh, from what Leeuwenhoek built uh, so many years ago. Uh, and this paper microscope, the amazing thing about this is it gives you significantly high resolutions um, and you're able to see things like, for example, in a drop of water uh, from your local pond um, or even from the tap uh, in a way that uh, really sparks your curiosity, right? So if you've never handled or looked at um, a fold scope, go look it up, right? Fold scope is available um, to buy in India as well. Uh, there is a company called Goody Labs, G-U-D-D-Y, right? Um, which sells fold scope in India, right? And it comes like a small pencil box. Um, and and it's, a, it's a really remarkable thing to see, right? Um, and, and what you realize is there is an immense power to be, a, to be able to look at things um, at a magnification that allows you to see that they exist, right? That there are things um, that move around that, you know, uh, cells which you normally wouldn't see, uh, you know, uh, once you start being able to see uh, these things, uh, you know, you are now curious about how they are uh, being put together, you know, how are they functioning? Why are they doing what they are doing? Um, and how are they doing? what they're doing, right? So, so that's the real power of being able to look at something. And clearly, the microscope, as many of you may have used, right, um, you know, has gone a long way uh, in, in kind of um, raising that curiosity, right? It's never been perfect. So it's, um, it's also possible that, you know, what you see, you don't fully understand. Uh, but that's fine. Um, as long as you see and you make observations based on that, you know, and you are curious enough to find out or think about what's actually happening. The hope is with time, you will have an understanding of the same as well. Right. Um, now, the, the thing to um, remember here is that a lot of the visualization uh, that happens through microscopes, particularly the light microscopes. Right. So everything, uh, including this particular microscope um, or uh, Manu's uh, fold scope uh, are all um, light microscopes. So essentially the source uh, of light that is being used to look at uh, stuff um, you know, has a significant impact um, on how you can resolve things, okay? Um, and this is something to go think a bit about, right? Uh, that um, what exactly is this uh, diffraction barrier, right? It's something um, that allows um, uh, you to be able to separate two objects um, as being two distinct objects, uh, provided the... Um, uh, the the beam of light uh, or in some case um, you know x-rays or um, electrons if you're using uh, an electron microscope um, is able to distinguish between these two objects um, as being two distinct objects right so if you have two objects that are uh, you know really close to each other 
um, you know, the magnification at which you are looking at it uh, and the way the light source is able to separate uh, these two objects uh, significantly affects your ability to see them as two distinct objects. Okay, um, and, and that is limited by uh, in light by the fact that light has a certain diffraction uh, barrier. Um, and, um, you know, there are, of course, classic examples of how uh, light is uh, used to perceive objects. The fact that you are looking at a screen and are able to see what's happening, uh, you know, is driven by the eye and how it is able to, uh, you know, observe light. Um, and focus it and allow you to see things, right? Um, and, and those kind of principles are built into the microscope as well, where, uh, you know, along with the light source, you have a set of, um, you know, objectives or lenses that um, allow you to magnify the object. Um, and then there is a, a receiver at the end. And the receiver at the end uh, in, in a light microscope could be your eye because it's actually looking at stuff. Um, or in case of more advanced microscopes, uh, it could be a recorder of some kind, right? Something that perceives the image. And now this image is transmitted in such a way that you can see it on a computer screen, right? So, um, so the idea of uh, the eye as an analogy is that um, along with objectives that are present, uh, you know, there is a, um, there is a sensor uh, that actually responds to the light that is being focused. Um, and now this allows you to visualize things, right? There are uh, many of us, um, you know, who might be color blind and are not able to, you know, distinctly separate out colors, uh, right? Um, and and there are many other changes that could happen, which means uh, for uh, for the eye to be able to perceive something, all these uh, machinery have to work properly, okay, to be able to allow you to visualize something, and that's. Uh, the same with microscopes as well, right? Um, so I'm not going to get into the details of how uh, diffraction, uh, you know, works. Um, and if you're curious, go read a little bit about it. The critical thing for you uh, to remember here is that um, the uh, extent of diffraction that happens is going to determine the nature uh, of the image uh, that you are going to be able to visualize. Okay, so um, this uh, makes a difference in also how much light is able to, um, you know, get into the objective uh, that allows you to now see things uh, very well, right? Um, and um, air has a certain diffraction that is the moment, uh, you know, light comes through, uh, you know, the way the light distributes uh, is different when the medium uh, that is there between the objective and your sample uh, is uh, is air, um, and that uh, can be altered uh, by using uh, you know the way uh, a, a medium that allows light to now uh, make it more light to make it into the uh, into the objective. Okay, one of the um, good examples of this, right? And I don't know how many of you note uh, is that. Um, uh, you know, if you have um, a, a very uh, dark room and a small source of light, uh, right, um, uh, to be able to, for your eye to perceive uh, that room, uh, to begin with, if you come from a bright uh, source, so if you have a tube light on in that room and you turn it off, right, um, you will not be able to see much at all. And this probably happens to all of us. Um, but you know, you give yourself some time uh, for your eye to adjust. Uh, the amount of the sensitivity, um, you know, changes quite pretty dramatically, um, and this allows you to now see things uh, in in the dark in a way that you couldn't about a couple of minutes ago. Right now, that's an example of how the sensitivity uh, of light uh, of um, you know your um, eye has changed. Uh, over a period of time. And in part, that is contributed by the fact that the eye is able to allow more light to get in, right? So when it is very bright, uh, you know, the amount of light could be regulated. And when the light goes down, uh, the amount of light getting into the eye uh, could be increased, right? And that allows for you to see things now in such a way that you couldn't uh, clearly some time back. Uh, in a loose sense, that's what's happening with the uh, uh, with microscopes of, um, as well, right? And the idea here is to be able to collect more light and send it into the objective of the microscope 
so that we are able to see things better, right? So uh, light gets collected in these different ways um, and gets directed um, into the objective. Um, and um, this is governed uh, by the numerical aperture. What you need to remember here is that the numerical aperture is the definition of how much light actually can get into the objective and the condenser, right? So every uh, objective, if you see, uh, you know, its um, resolving power uh, can be variable depending upon uh, one, um, as I said, the magnification uh, that it has. Um, and, um, you know, things like the numerical aperture. Uh, has a significant effect on on the on the resolution that you are having, right? Um, also, as I said, that the beam of light uh, or the beam that you are not just light um, of say electrons that you are using to illuminate the uh, the sample um, has a significant effect on um, on the quality of resolution because light has a certain wavelength. And that ensures that it will be able to only separate two objects that are uh, that have a separation that is more than the wavelength of light, right? So if they are really, really close, uh, you know, chances are the wavelength of light becomes limiting uh, in determining or being able to resolve these two objects. Okay, um, there are many different kinds of microscopes, and this is just a kind of way to give you a sense of. Uh, you know, what kind of light sources uh, can be used to enhance the contrast and be able to see things that you otherwise may not be able to see, right? So even with light microscopes, there are variations here, right? Bright field, face contrast, DIC, dark field, polarized light microscope, um, all essentially using light to illuminate the object slightly differently for uh, you to, for, to allow you to be able to see things, right? 